All right, good morning. My name is Danny Moran. I'm an instructor here at Sprinklomatic University, and I wanted to welcome you to Sprinklomatic University and introduce our uh, second class in the fire protection program that we have going on. This is going to be Sprinklers 101. Uh, just talking about the university a little bit. We're very proud of our team that has come together to make Sprinklomatic University a fully functioning learning center. From right here in the classroom to our wet lab, if you will, outside, I think you're going to see that the slogan, We Go the Extra Mile from Sprinklomatic, we truly backed up by our actions. Uh, Sprinklomatic is in the business of saving lives, and they're doing that through their systems that are currently standing guard against uh, the hazards of fire and to the ones that are being designed right here in the office. Uh, so, I put this little collage together just to show a few things of what uh, is happening here at Sprinklomatic and with Sprinklomatic University. Uh, pictures of our team winning some awards from Dale Carnegie up here, doing some uh, fire department test header flow tests. Uh, we have our best practices day where the team is uh, recognized by Robin and the uh, administrative staff here at, at Sprinklermatic and uh, they're given awards and really recognized for their efforts all year round to make Sprinklermatic such a successful company and they also have vendors come in and they uh, get their annual recertifications done there um, like uh, fitting pipes and, and taking classes here at best practices. A couple other events that are going on um, down here in the in this corner right here in this picture. Uh, Sprinklomatic has a, a portable fire pump, rentfirepumps.com, and they uh, they bring their fire pumps to buildings that have impairments for fire pumps, and uh, you can hook the the pump right up to the building and and um, operate the fire sprinkler systems and the sandpipes through their fire pump, and we've incorporated those trailers into classes. So this right here was down at Miami Dade Fire Rescue at their training facility where they tied into the building down there and put on a full fire pump class with uh, standpipes and, and valves and really did a lot of cool things. They did the same thing over here at the Fort Lauderdale Fire Expo. Uh, the gentleman here in the red shirt, that's Captain Bill Gustin from Miami Dade Fire Rescue. He's a legend in the fire service. And you see the same gentleman up here in the corner. He works for Fire Engineering Magazine as well and they do webcasts uh, called Hump Day Hangouts every Wednesday and Bill Gustin is one of the guys that does the Hump Day Hangouts. He's going to be uh, doing live broadcasts here from Sprinkomatic University. They already did one and it was a huge hit. Had a lot of feedback from all around the country. So uh, Sprinkomatic University is definitely making a name for itself uh, around the country. And we're really proud of that. So we're going to talk today about uh, Fire Sprinklers 101. We're basically going to be covering uh, NFPA standards that govern fire sprinklers and standpipes, like NFPA 13, NFPA 14, uh, the Florida Building Code we'll touch on, and also talk about NFPA 25 when it comes to the inspections, testing, and maintenance. So, uh, talking about fire sprinklers, I think uh, I'm a, a little history buff. I like to know the reasons of why things exist in the world, especially when it comes to uh, science and math. Uh, so. When we talk about fire sprinklers, I think it's important to look back and, and look at where they came from. Why, why do we have these standards that govern uh, fire sprinkler systems? So uh, we go back to Chicago in 1903 to the Iroquois Theater and we see, the, uh, with the exception of 9-11 obviously, this is the deadliest single building fire in American history. Uh, with, uh, I believe there was uh, about 590 people that died on scene and uh, a dozen or so died later on in hospitals. Uh, when the building was being built, the Chicago Fire Commissioner and the, uh, excuse me, the, the Chicago Building Commissioner and the Fire Inspector, when they were inspecting the building, they were marveled in how luxurious the building was and said that it was beyond doubt uh, fireproof and it had um, 27, uh, 30 exits with 27 of them being double doors and uh, they were just really impressed with how fireproof the building was. And there was a write up in the, uh, about the Iroquois Theater. It said no expense was spared in the construction of the luxurious theater. Now, obviously, we're talking about it for a reason. I think we can all agree that there was an expense that was spared, and that was the fire sprinkler system. Uh, interestingly enough, at the same time that the building commissioner and the fire inspector were raving about this place, uh, there was a magazine in circulation at the time called Fireproof, and the editor of that magazine wrote a scathing editorial about it, uh, saying that it, it definitely had a lot of hazards and needed to be addressed. So. The night of this fire, there was a packed house for a matinee performance, and the stage manager wanted to take in the show with the audience. So he left the stage and went out to sit in the audience, 
and all the other stagehands, they kind of went out and uh, and left the theater. Also, went to local bars to drink while the while the show was going on. And uh, a spotlight operator noticed that a fire had started backstage, uh, and of course, an area where there's wooden props and oily rags. So uh, it was not fireproof, and without the fire alarm or without the fire sprinkler system, things turned really bad, and we ended up having this uh, this massive deadly fire. Um, the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire in New York City in 1911. Uh, this was very big for industrial workplace safety codes uh, after this fire occurred. Uh, the interesting thing about this is that at this time, it was uh, there was a lot of corruption in uh, levels of government, and it was kind of a known thing that some building owners, like uh, this Shirtwaist Factory Fire, which was a true sweatshop, uh, they, they were... Um, they were prone to burn their buildings down. They burn, they burn their buildings down at night so they can collect on insurance uh, monies. And when they did that, uh, nobody really said anything about it because everybody had their hands in it. So the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire, they did not set this fire intentionally. They were not trying to burn the building down then because it happened while the building was occupied with the workers. Unfortunately though, all the, uh, the, the doors, the exit doors were locked. There was only one stairwell that led down to a locked door. Uh, there was no fire sprinkler system in place, and uh, like I said, talking about the corruption, a reason why there was no fire sprinkler system in place is that uh, people were signing off on the buildings being built without fire sprinklers in it because they were part of the hands that were in the corruption uh, and collecting on insurance monies. So nobody really said anything about no fire sprinkler system being placed in this building until, it was, uh, until the fire occurred while it was occupied with all the workers. The Coconut Grove Nightclub Fire. Uh, this was a, a, a very big fire in Boston. 490 people died here. Uh, interesting story about this one is that there was a college bowl game during the day uh, on November 28th there where Boston College actually lost a bowl game that they were supposed to win. So this place was supposed to be the stage for their celebration party after the bowl game. Uh, so uh, Boston College, because they lost, they were not present inside here at the time. Uh, but the place was packed anyways because there was a party expected. So it was a full house. The Melody Lounge was a part of the, uh, the facility down in the basement. And legend has it that a, uh, a gentleman that was on a date with his girlfriend wanted a little bit more romantic setting. So he unscrewed a light bulb to make it a little bit more romantic setting at the table. And uh, that caused a dark area of the, of the lounge. So a busboy was given the assignment to go replace the light bulb. And when he went down there, he couldn't see what he was doing. So of course he stands on a, a chair uh, next to some highly flammable uh, wall finishes and, and coverings, and he lights a match so he can see what he's doing. And he started a fire that spread very rapidly through the, through the Melody Lounge downstairs and right up the uh, single staircase up into the night, nightclub part of the establishment. There was no fire alarm and no fire sprinkler system present. Again, the common denominator in all these fires. And looking at um, historical fires, this one and another one that we're going to talk about really come into play with a lot of similarities when we look at uh, a station, the Station Nightclub fire, which is one of recent times. The Wyckoff Hotel fire in, in Georgia is the deadliest hotel fire in American history. Again, this building was deemed to be fireproof construction, however, there were no fire escapes, no fire doors. Uh, this fire started in the middle of the night while everybody was sleeping. So anybody that was basically above the area of origin, which was around the uh, fourth floor, uh, they were unable to make it out because uh, the stairwells were filled with smoke and there was no fire escapes and also no fire sprinkler system to suppress the fire. Our Lady of Angel School Fire, we go back to Chicago. Deadly school fire in American history with 95 deaths, most of them being school children, unfortunately. And this one also started in the basement area of the school. Uh, just before school dismissal, a teacher asked a couple of students to go throw some stuff in the in the trash bin down in the basement and when they came back they told the teacher that they smelled something burning downstairs. That, uh, they, they saw smoke and they could smell it and uh, before you know it the fire spread very fast up the staircase. Uh, there was a fire alarm there but it was not connected to the fire department and uh, this fire actually led to a lot of changes in the fire alarm codes as well because uh, a switch that was on the wall that looked just like a light switch, which actually was the fire alarm for the school. It was confused. Nobody really knew that something that looked just like a light switch was uh, to activate the fire alarm as well. 
Uh, but either way, it wasn't connected to the fire department, so the fire department would have known that there was a fire happening. So there was a delay in response. There was only one fire door, and that was on the first floor only. So most of these 95 deaths occurred um, with the teachers and nuns and the students on the second floor of the building that they were unable to escape. The Beverly Hills Supper Club fire in Kentucky, this is another one uh, similar to the Coconut Grove nightclub um, with very similar aspects to the station nightclub fire of recent times. So we see that you know, when, when we talk about historical fires and we, and we look at history and we say, hey, if we don't learn from our past, you know, we're going to let history repeat itself. We no doubt about it have let it repeat itself when it comes to fire suppression systems and large occupancies like this. So this supper club fire, there was a, a very um, packed establishment. There was over, over 3,000 people there, way beyond the capacity of the place. There was uh, very limited street and road access for the fire department's uh, apparatus to respond, which led to a delay in getting water on the fire. There was blocked fire hydrants, so they had no water to put on the fire right away when they did get there. Um, and again, the common denominator, no fire alarm and no fire sprinkler system. The MGM Grand Fire in Las Vegas. Uh, this is the second deadliest hotel in American fire history. The reason why I like talking about this one is because this one really kind of set the stage for uh, people to understand that you don't necessarily have to be burned by fire to uh, die from a fire, especially in a hotel structure like this. Most of the 85 deaths related to this fire were due to smoke inhalation. So uh, in the fire service, there's an old saying that you know, you're smoked before you're roasted, and this one, no doubt about it, proved that. And again, there was no fire sprinklers for the casino and the restaurant area. This building was partially sprinklered for limited areas. The reason being, the mindset behind that was that uh, the casino and the restaurant were supposed to be occupied 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So if a fire were to occur in there, uh, it would, people would know about it. There would be early notification. People would be able to react and get out and notify the fire department. However, the restaurant where the fire occurred in the MGM Grand, that's where the fire originated. Uh, the restaurant at the time was closed. So uh, where they uh, assumed that people would be there 24-7, uh, at the time of this fire, Murphy's Law says that, uh, you know, there was nobody present and the fire started, nobody knew about it. Uh, smoke spread very rapidly through the entire building and people that were nowhere near the seat of the fire ended up dying in stairwells and in their hotel rooms from, from the smoke. So then we fast forward through, uh, you know, going back to 1903 in Chicago, we fast forward all the way up to 2003 and we're still having... Uh, massive fires in establishments with no fire sprinkler systems. The Station Nightclub, 100 people died here. And again, uh, I think we all have seen the video of this on, on YouTube of the gentleman that's inside watching the, the band play and the band is playing on stage. They're using pyrotechnic displays and some of the material around the stage catches fire. And uh, as the gentleman realizes that something is not right, he starts walking out and he's still recording as he's walking out. You can really see the smoke start spreading. The band goes off the stage and then pure panic sets in and, uh, and the place burns down and nobody was able to, to get out in time. Uh, 100 people died in there and, and again, uh, most of them were dead before they were burned because of the smoke, uh, but there was insufficient amount of exits and again, no fire sprinkler system present in a, in a very large establishment. So this is uh, a video that NIST did recreating the station nightclub. So if you've seen the video on YouTube of the gentleman that's inside recording this, this is about his vantage point, and you can see the fire start going up the back of the stage here. When he sees that smoke racing across the ceiling, he starts saying to himself, something's not right here, I, I'm gonna start backing out of here. So he starts leaving the club, and as he's walking away, he's still recording, and you can really start seeing the fire just take off, and uh, eventually people start noticing that it's not right also, and they start trying to leave. And right about this point, the band is looking around, and they're like, oh man, you know, this isn't good, we're bailing out of here. Uh, some of them went out the back door. If I'm not mistaken, I think a member of the band was killed as well, uh, wasn't able to get out. 
But if you look at the time frame here, we're at a minute after the fire ignited. And if you look at that smoke that's coming down right there, that is just nasty, choking, super hot smoke. And a minute and 15 seconds into this, that smoke is right about at eye level. Uh, people are breathing that in right now. And if you're not able to evacuate right now, uh, nobody's, able, you know, that's, that's why a lot of people died here because the exit doors were blocked. Um, there were so many people trying to exit at the same time that nobody could get out. And that's why there were so many people that, that died there. And this is a very similar video from NIST. Another recreation. This time they put a fire sprinkler. Fire sprinklers in the room. And again, the exact same setup, same type of ignition. The only difference is the sprinklers. Now I'm not saying that fire sprinklers in this nightclub would have prevented everybody from dying. I still think, my personal opinion, I think people still would have died. Uh, again, a lot due to smoke inhalation. Um, but I, I think a lot more people would have been able to get out in time without being burned to death. But there's still, I, I, my personal thoughts are there still would have been dozens of people that died from smoke inhalation. Because the, while the sprinklers are controlling the fire, that smoke is still blowing around inside the place. But you can already see the, the difference from the prior video. We're coming up on that minute mark where that smoke was just banked down at about head, head level, maybe even lower. And uh, about a minute and 15 seconds into it, that's when all that smoke flashed over. And you can see the difference that the fire sprinklers make inside the building. Again, yeah, still a lot of smoke, so I, I still think people would have died, just not a hundred. My opinion. All right, so going from those historic fires uh, and looking at the history of sprinkler systems, um, we get into NFPA 13. Now, interestingly enough, NFPA uh, became an, an organization because of the development of fire sprinklers. Uh, back in the 1870s, when the first automatic fire sprinkler was invented, um, there was nobody governing the installation or the maintenance or anything to do with the sprinklers itself, uh, from the design, the flow, nothing. So um, plumbers, that's right, plumbers uh, actually had a hard time looking at how to uh, properly install them and work on them when there was, when there was problems. So uh, some people from the insurance companies got together and they had a meeting and they were talking about, you know, trying to establish uh, codes where fire sprinklers could fall in line. And that meeting, the first meeting for NFPA was held in 1895. And uh, in 1896, all the, the first standards uh, started coming about. And one of them was NFPA 13. So uh, they covered the installation of automatic sprinkler systems. We went almost an entire hundred years before that original standard was, and uh, the addition was entirely rewritten. So every few years, NFPA Technical Committee gets together and they review the standard and they look at uh, changes that they need to make and they do so accordingly. The reason why they do this is because uh, as technology changes, they need to change the standard as well. So they get together to have meetings and they review things and they rewrite. Uh, 1996, there was a big change to the addition with application of placement and location of spacing. Uh, location and spacing of sprinklers um, and again that's this time frame in the early 90s I think the reason why there was so many tremendous changes to the NFPA standard at this time was due to all the plastics that were uh, coming about at the time um, really led to changes in the way that fire sprinkler systems had to be designed and fire protection 2010 there was a big change for storage protection um, and again not only because of the types of commodities but uh, and the hazards, but also the way that the, the, those hazards are stored, and they're all stored in, in plastics with uh, plastic wrap and stuff. So 
So like I said, in the 1870s, the first automatic fire sprinkler was invented. Um, that's uh, as early as a picture I could find of one. Uh, very high thermal mass meant extremely slow response times. And what I mean by that is that uh, the sprinkler head itself, it had a orifice on it that was covered with a plate that was almost similar to a salt and pepper shaker. So it just had a bunch of, uh, a bunch of, little, or a bunch of little holes in it uh, at the end of the nozzle. All of those holes on, that, on the discharge, they were covered with a metal plate. And the metal plate, the entire sprinkler itself, and also the water in the piping had to heat up to the melting point of the heating element in order for the sprinkler to activate. So that's why we had extremely slow response times. And we fast forward to 1890s and there was a great improvement and that was diffusible length. And so what this did is it reduced the thermal mass and it increased the sprinkler's response time. Increased meaning not slowed it, but increased the time of action for the sprinkler to put water on the fire. In 1953, NFPA met and uh, they, they started requiring use of standard spray deflectors. And when they required the standard spray deflector, this was the beginning of the uh, directional orientation for sprinklers when you come to upright, pendant, and sidewall. And the reason being is that each one has its own uh, special type of deflector. The upright strip sprinkler has uh, a deflector that almost looks like an umbrella shape because the water comes up before it goes back down, so the umbrella deflector sends it in the direction it needs. The pendant right here is just kind of a straight um, uh, separated deflector that separates the water stream into the into the spray pattern and then the side walls um, obviously spray out along the side and, and very little go up. This is uh, some of the releasing mechanisms for sprinklers. You have the fusible link and the frangible bulb and the chemical pellet and, uh, and then like we talked about the sprinkler designs, the pendant, and the sidewall, and upright. So the sprinkler head components, you have the frame itself, and inside that frame is where you have the heating element, whether it's the glass bulb, the chemical pellet, or a fusible link, and that's held in place with a, a plug that, that keeps the orifice closed, not allowing the water to come in until the sprinkler is um, activated, and the deflector is held in place with, uh, with a screw. All right, so uh, talking about um, types of sprinklers. The last class that we had, there was a gentleman here from a, another fire sprinkler contractor, and he talked about how he's been around the business a long time, and he said that he remembers a time when there wasn't really so many options. It was a lot easier to design and install sprinkler heads because there wasn't so many options. So with the advancements in technology, the NFPA standard changes, and you end up having a whole bunch of different types of sprinkler heads. So we're basically going to talk about the three main types, and it's control mode, suppression, and residential. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that these sprinklers are not designed to fully extinguish a fire. The control mode sprinklers are designed to exactly do that. Control the fire, meaning uh, keep the growth in check, um, but it's, it, they're mainly designed to protect the building, so that the building doesn't burn down. Uh, suppression sprinkler heads, these are taking the place of um, the ESFRs, they're taking the place of in-rack storage sprinklers, uh, let's say in like your Home Depots and your Lowe's. Um, they really, with their the design themselves, the amount of water that they put out and the size of the droplets, they actually are designed to have their water penetrate through uh, thermal columns and get down and, and almost put the fire out. And the residential sprinkler heads, a completely different standard. Um, they're more of a life safety uh, sprinkler system as opposed to property con property protection. There's a little uh, misunderstanding sometimes when it comes to um, basically just semantics, when it comes to fast response and quick response. Sometimes uh, people will say that a fast response sprinkler, because it has a fast response heating element in it, it that it's a quick response sprinkler. And it's basically just semantics, but quick response is a listed sprinkler. And it really has uh, a big impact when you look at designs because if you have a uh, sprinkler head that is not listed as a quick response, it can have a fast response heating element in the sprinkler, but if it's not listed, you really need to watch your design areas because uh, the, a quick response sprinkler, you can reduce your design area by up to 40%. So 
you yeah, really have to be careful when you're looking at uh, the words here, but basically fast response refers to the heating element itself. Um, and this refers to residential sprinklers, the listed quick response sprinklers, and the ESFRs. They go through a special test. This is a plunge oven over here. And basically what this does is um, heat is basically transferred through fire from the ignition through extinguishment in three main ways. And it's convection, conduction, and radiation. So what this does is that this plunge oven basically has a, uh, a thermal column. Uh, it simulates a thermal column from a fire. As the fire grows, the heat rises to the ceiling and creates a ceiling jet. And as that ceiling jet races across the ceiling, uh, heat is spreading by convection. So that's what's going on inside this oven. Uh, when the convected heat hits the sprinkler head, now we have heat being conducted through uh, conduction. And that's what activates the sprinkler head. So the sprinklers get tested in the sponge oven and the quick response or fast response heating elements, they need to activate in uh, what is determined to be 50 and a half meters per second. There's a, a long mathematical formula that is unnecessary for this class to get into that to figure out how they get to that number. Uh, so we won't talk about the formula itself, but the response time index for fast response elements and, and then their listed quick response sprinklers must be 15 and a half meters per second or less. Standard response heating elements um, are at 80 and a half meters per second in this plunge oven test. And the residential fire sprinklers go through a very special test. They're completely different, like I talked about, from the ESFRs and the control. Um, the residential fire sprinklers is a life safety sprinkler system. So what that means is that they are strictly designed to prevent a room from flashing over. And how do they do that is that as that thermal column from the fire rises and spreads across the ceiling, that ceiling jet is basically what starts the flashover process. As the ceiling jet spreads throughout the room, it, it goes uh, as far as it can go before it starts banking down. And when it starts banking down, that's when we get everything else in the room reaching its ignition temperature, which creates the flashover. So if you put a, a residential sprinkler head inside of a room, inside of a compartment, uh, what it's going to do is discharge its spray uh, at a no, no more than 28 inches down on the wall. So this is a very different spray pattern than your average sprinkler. It's a high, flat, lifted spray pattern that goes up across the room and, um, and is not supposed to have its spray hit the wall any more than 28 inches down. They go through a ton of tests before they're listed as a true residential fire sprinkler. Um, the sidewall sprinklers, they have to be measured to spray 5% of their discharge on the wall to which they're installed. Um, so, and then down here, this is a, uh, the collector pans this is basically a, a diagram showing uh, the test room that residential sprinklers are tested in. So the, the line across the wall here, that's the 28 inch mark. The spray pattern cannot go from the sprinkler. It cannot go down and hit that wall directly past there. It's going to be high and flat across the room. Um, and then the water is all collected in the in collector pans at the bottom to measure the discharge densities. Here's a couple pictures of the difference in the sprays. This is that residential sprinkler. Again, if you look at the standard spray, the standard spray you can see that has a more downward slope to spray pattern where the residential is, is lifted and flat. It's specifically designed to deliver water up into that hot upper gas layer that we talked about with that ceiling jet and prevent the room from flashing over. And that's why that's called a life safety uh, sprinkler system as opposed to a control mode which is straight, uh, more designed to uh, protect buildings uh, and property and you see that more in uh, large industrial uh, structures as opposed to residences. So here's some uh, pictures of sprinkler heads with standard response elements. Uh, this is the frangible bowl and the standard response element is a five millimeter bowl and ranging from temperatures uh, for ordinary at 155 all the way up to uh, ultra high, up to 500 degrees. This is a picture to show you the difference of the fast response element. So back here we have the standard response element. Uh, it's a five millimeter bulb, and the fat, this fast response element is a three millimeter bulb. So it's a lot skinnier. It activates faster than the standard response. It takes less time for the 
uh, heating element to activate. Upright sprinklers are placed on uh, pipes coming out of the top of the pipe. Uh, they have the, the deflector that's shaped like an umbrella to direct their water in a downward pattern. The pendant sprinklers, uh, they protrude either through a ceiling or just come out from the bottom of uh, exposed piping. And again, their deflector is flat uh, and again, it's designed to break up that stream and still have the water go down. Sidewall sprinklers. Uh, obviously coming out through the side of the wall, you can have horizontal or vertical. And when we talk about sprinkler heads themselves, a couple things that we've already talked about, the orientation, whether they are a, a pendant upright or horizontal sidewall. Uh, a, another main thing that you need to keep in mind is the K factor. So basically the K factor, uh, there's three different thread sizes, half inch, three quarter inch, or one inch. And what the K-factor means is that it's basically just saying how big the opening is or the orifice of the sprinkler head. So uh, the, the K-factor is uh, a number that's given to the sprinkler to represent the hydraulic characteristics of that sprinkler head. Basically what it means is that the higher the K-factor means you're getting more water flow but at less pressure. Um, as the K-factor decreases, you get less water flow but at higher pressure. So you'll see, uh, just throwing out random numbers, a let's say a residential sprinkler head will uh, have a K factor of say 5.6, uh, whereas an ESFR could have a K factor of 25.2. And that's basically a difference of uh, water flow and pressure with the K factor. So getting to know your sprinkler head, each head is uh, stamped with certain things on it. Again, this is all uh, governed by NFPA to require these things on there. Somewhere on the sprinkler head, mainly on the deflector, you'll see the K factor. So this K factor right here, 25.2. That's a lot of water at not so much pressure. And the orientation pendant, there's an ESFR sprinkler head. Uh, it has its listings right here from Factory Mutual, NUL. Uh, the model of the sprinkler uh, will be on the pendant and also the temperature at which it's designed to activate. Okay, going into uh, the classifications of occupancies with NFPA. Um, again, a lot of this has changed throughout the years as well. And um, it's very important to understand a couple different aspects of it. But the main thing is that light hazard, uh, for an example, like residential places, we're dealing with quantity and combustibility of the contents is low. And the fires are going to have a relatively low rate of heat, heat release. Uh, just a couple of examples like churches and clubs, hospitals, museums, and uh, anything residential. So ordinary hazard group one, uh, if you look at restaurants here as light hazard, you go to ordinary hazard group one, and if the restaurant service areas, like say the kitchen, the kitchen inside of a restaurant is going to be ordinary hazard group one. So sometimes you have uh, one building that has a couple different areas in it, with different cl uh, classifications of the occupancy. And they have to be, uh, the sprinkler system has to be designed accordingly. Warrior has a group two, gets into um, stockpiles of contents. Uh, basically, um, the high rates of heat, heat release and um, the stockpiles don't exceed eight feet. I just couple, uh, points on this is that in 1993 we had a complete or complete rewrite of the standard in 1993. In the last class that we did I asked uh, why did why does somebody think that in 1993 we had a complete rewrite of this one and somebody said well something must have happened and that's exactly what it is. Something happened, uh, something always needs to be a catalyst for change and what happened in 19, um, 93, well, it, excuse me, in 1991, which made that standard change in 1993, was a very infamous fire in Philadelphia, uh, the One Meridian Plaza building. This fire started uh, on a floor where the uh, fire sprinklers were out of service for maintenance, and uh, they ended up gutting, the fire ended up gutting eight floors of the building. Started on the 22nd floor, went all the way up to 30. Uh, over 300 firefighters operated this fire, and unfortunately, three of those firefighters were killed. 
Um, one of the big things here, I call this the perfect storm of system failures, is because not only were part of the sprinkler systems out of service, but when the firefighters arrived and they made it to the floor to start trying to put water on the fire, they could not get water, or they had water, but they could not get enough pressure out of the valves for their hose rings to fight the fire. Um, they had some uh, pressure reducing valves present, they were unexperienced, untrained on them, and they didn't have the tools needed to properly adjust them to, to get extra flow. Uh, so ironically, they actually ended up calling out a building maintenance guy who showed up with the tools to adjust these pressure reducing valves. And um, with those tools, the firefighters were able to get a little bit more water out of the hoses, but unfortunately it was too late for the firefighters that were killed. And ultimately, uh, while their hose lines eventually started working, what really did put this fire out was when the fire reached the floor where the fire sprinkler systems were uh, currently up and working and about 10 sprinkler heads actually ended up putting out this fire with the assistance of the fire department. About like hundred million dollars in estimated property losses and over four billion dollars in civil litigation costs. But at the end of the day, all the money aside, this right here is the only thing that really matters. We lost people that came here to this fire to, uh, to try and put it out. And uh, again, a lot of it had to do with just a, a perfect storm of the system failures. Uh, there seems to be a big uh, disconnect uh, in the fire service when it comes to communication between uh, fire prevention people, fire sprinkler contractors, and fire operations. So, I'm not saying that would have prevented these deaths, uh, but uh, one thing that's really good about Sprinkler Mac University here is that we're kind of bridging the gap between all three of those parties bring them together here and, uh, and talking about things and getting on the same page. So that building that had a fire sprinkler system that was out of service on the 22nd floor, um, did the fire department know about it? I don't know, maybe they did, maybe they didn't. But either way, if the fire department knows about it, that information should be communicated to the guys that are gonna be responding to that building to fight the fire. And uh, sometimes there's just a lack of communication and nobody really knows that parts of buildings may be out of service for maintenance. So getting into standpipe classifications, um, NFPA defines standpipes classified in, in three different classes, class one, two, and three. So a class one standpipe system basically provides a two and a half inch hose connection only, and it's only to be used by responding fire departments to connect their hoses to. Uh, cla uh, class one, this is a, a picture of a class one standpipe and it also has a, uh, a drain riser on it. So I was doing some training at the fire department one day and um, a guy said, you know, if we we're gonna hook our hoses up to this standpipe, we're gonna hook one line up here to the valve and then if we needed a backup hose line, what are we gonna, where are we gonna put it? Are we gonna put it here? And I said, well, what is that other pipe in that outlet for? And the an answer to that question was unknown. So this is where the disconnect comes in, and we as firefighters need to understand that uh, that is not enough. That is not a discharge. That's actually uh, the 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 drain where every five years NFPA 25 requires a full flow test of this hose valve, and that's the drain where that water is going to go into, so it doesn't flood the building. Uh, class two standpipe. Uh, this is a standpipe system which provides an inch and a half hose station. Um, and is uh, mainly primarily there for trained personnel or fire department for initial operations. Um, when I train the firefighters, I always tell them, firefighters class two is not for you. Uh, the reason being is that it's, uh, it's a sub substandard discharge outlet for our hoses. It uh, only allows us to use inch and three quarter hose and not two and a half. And uh, the hose itself inside here, uh, there could be a there could be a PRB in here limiting the pressure uh, to no more than 100 PSI. So even if we took that hose off and hooked our hose lines onto it, we're gonna be, uh, we're gonna be below where we need to be with our pressure for the hose line. So fire departments should not be using class two systems. Um, there was a good discussion in the class last time. Uh, we had a gentleman from Miami-Dade and um, they had a high rise fire where one of these hose lines was put into play and being operated before the fire department got there. So when the fire department arrived and they started hooking up their hose lines, they see that there was a house line stretched down the hallway. Uh, one of their guys went over and manned that line 
while they were setting up their hose lines to fully extinguish the fire, and uh, it actually kept the fire in check. So, uh, you know, in the fire service, we have sayings like, never say never, and never say always. Uh, this is one of those times where when I say class two is not for you, but did it help prevent the spread of the fire in this building? It absolutely did. The guy on the end of the nozzle was able to keep the fire in check and limit it to um, not coming out into the hallway while the rest of the crew members set up their hose line. Uh, class three standpipe system is a standpipe system which provides inch and a half hose stations um, for the trained personnel or fire departments during initial operations. And it also gives fire departments a two and a half inch hose connection to supply that larger volume of water. Uh, which obviously the uh, building occupants are not supposed to be using. So this is a common sit, uh, setup where you'll see where you have a uh, class three system with the inch and a half discharge here with the hose connected and a separate two and a half inch outlet. Sometimes you'll see it with no hose in place uh, with just an inch and a half and a two and a half inch discharge inside of there. All right, different types of standpipes. Uh, we, they're, they're basically, it's either gonna be wet or it's gonna be dry. Um, we'll talk about the dry standpipe system first and, uh, and talk about terms. So you'll hear terms like automatic and manual. Basically, if you just think about it, automatic means it happens without any kind of human inter intervention. And manual requires hands-on intervention from a human. So your automatic dry standpipe system is attached to a water supply that's capable of supplying the system to man at all times. It's automatic because when air is released, that dry pat valve is going to open, allowing water to flow into the piping system, and uh, you're going to get water out of your hose valve off the standpipe, or you're going to get water out of your sprinkler, which is activated um, due to its heat response element. Uh, the compressed air supply has to be available at all times, and also has to be capable of restoring normal air pressure in the system uh, within 30 minutes. These systems is activated by that dry pipe valve and um, really when you hear um, talking about the dry pipe valve it's all about differential. So on the standpipe at the dry pipe valve you'll see two pressure gauges. One is for water on the bottom side of the valve and the other is for the air on the top. And Some people think that the, uh, the air pressure is heavier than water and that's simply not the case. It all comes down to a differential. And what I mean by it is that is that it's the size of the area that the air is uh, compressing on. So uh, the dry pipe valve that we have out here at Spring Matic University has a differential of 5.5, meaning that the surface area on top of the valve is 5.5 5 times larger than the underside. So the air is acting on a larger uh, surface area than the water, and that's what keeps that valve closed. When the air is released, like I said, due to the valve uh, a hose valve opening or a sprinkler head being activated, you're going to get water automatically. Okay, the automatic wet standpipe system, again, automatic meaning that it's capable of supplying the system demand on its own at all times. Uh, this requires no other action than opening that hose valve or having a sprinkler head discharge. Water is in the pipes at all times. Obviously, you're not going to uh, you're not going to have water in the pipes uh, in climates where you experience freezing. And I think actually in Florida, uh, the freeze line, according to NFPA, is somewhere around the Orlando area. So in the middle of the state north, you see a lot more dry systems than you see down here. But we can still have them down here in uh, like dry cooler docks and stuff. So uh, we talked about the automatic and now talking about the manual. So the manual obviously uh, requires on something else to supply the system demand, which that would be the fire department. A manual dry standpipe system is not attached to a water supply whatsoever. So there is no dry pipe valve. Uh, nothing's coming through that system unless the fire department is supplying the water. A manual wet standpipe system contains water at all times. So if the sprinkler head does activate, water will be coming out. If you open up a hose valve, water will be coming out. However, this, this type of system relies exclusively on the fire department to supply the system demand. And again, that's the manual wet standpipe system. A um, couple other types of uh, the dry standpipes. You have a semi-automatic semi dry pipe system, which uh, really deals with uh, deluge systems. Um, again, it's capable of supplying the system demand at all time. 
uh, requires activation of a remote control device uh, to provide water at the hose connection. Uh, Semi-automatic drive standpipe systems, really the ones that we uh, really want to talk about are the single interlock and the double interlock. Uh, the non-interlock basically is, uh, is similar to here with the, with the deluge valve. A single interlock uh, means that uh, your air is for supervisory only in the system. So if a sprinkler head uh, activates or if a sprinkler head gets hit by something accidentally, um, the air is going to leave the system. You're going to have the uh, supervisory alarm at the panel and then water is going to flow. So you're still going to get water out of your system if you break a sprinkler head or if the sprinkler head activates with a single interlock. With a double interlock, it's a little bit different. We're going to see these in places where somebody's very concerned about accidental water discharge. So with the double interlocking system, I could knock a sprinkler head out of place and break it, um, and I'm not going to get water coming out of there. And the reason being is that it needs to operate, it needs that activation of a remote control device as well, like let's say a, a smoke detector. So if a sprinkler head is broken or activates because of heat, uh, and you also have the smoke detector operating as well, that's what's going to get uh, water through the system in your double interlocking uh, standpipe system. Okay, so talking about the floor and building code a little bit, uh, the class one standpipes, uh, they say allowed to be automatic dry, automatic wet, any of the above in uh, buildings that are not classified as a high rise. Uh, so NFPA 14 and the Florida building code have a definition of a high rise where the floor of the occupied, the highest occupiable story is greater than 75 feet. So what that means is that uh, basically seven or eight stories uh, or above, that's you're going to be your definition of a high rise building according to NFPA 14 and the Florida Building Code. Um, in buildings where it is a high rise building, uh, the class one standpipe, uh, it must be either automatic or semi-automatic and uh, they're usually wet unless, like I said, we have uh, an, you're an area where the climate is subject to freezing, then it can be dry. Um, but those low, those smaller buildings, the uh, the buildings that are not defined as a high-rise building, those that's the one that we're going to have uh, a lot of the manual systems in, the manual dryer, the manual wet. Okay, and in class two and class three standpipe, the Florida Building Code and FPA 14 will tell you that. It has to be automatic wet and located in a facility where, unless you have uh, in a facility where the piping is subject to freezing, uh, then it can be an automatic dry or semi-automatic dry. The reason why it's important to talk about the difference with that manual system is, uh, again, almost like the uh, response time index of sprinklers when you talk about fast response and quick response, uh, it really just comes down to semantics. So uh, the definitions matter. So Buildings that are not defined as a high rise are allowed to have these um, the manual standpipes in them, and you're going to see that in buildings uh, over three stories in height, uh, or where the floor level of the highest story is more than 30 feet above vehicular access. And uh, so basically, those buildings that are from three stories up to seven stories, you're going to have manual standpipes in them, which means that the fire department must supply the system demand at all times. And the excuse me, uh, class one building or class one standpipes, they are allowed in the buildings equipped with an automatic sprinkler system, meeting NFPA 13 and 13R. And this one just happens to be a class one standpipe, but it's a manual wet standpipe. This is the building that this standpipe is in right here. It is not defined as a high rise building, so this is a manual wet standpipe. Um, the, Floor level of the highest occupiable story is less than 75 feet uh, above the, the vehicular access, and this water, this standpipe contains water at all times. However, like I said, the fire department has to use the fire department connection here to supply the system demand. Um, otherwise, you're not going to get the proper flow out of there. So, fire hose valves. Typical things that we're going to see. Uh, couple different types of valves. You have your standard weight hose valve, uh, a standard weight hose valve with a pressure restricting device on it, or a actual factory built 
pressure reducing valve, whether it's factory set or field adjustable. And what that means is that inside of a building, let's say we have a, a 20 story building, um, we know that it takes about, it takes 4.34 pounds to ride, to have a, a column of water rise 10 feet. So if we round up to five, in a 20 story building, you're basically gonna have 100 pounds of head pressure coming down from the roof of the building to the ground floor. Um, NFPA 14 tells you that uh, you have to have a minimum of 100 PSI static and residual um, coming out of any discharge in the building. Uh, and it's, it's between 100 and 175. So if we take that 20 story building and we have 100 pounds of head pressure, well, we need 100 pounds static or residual pressure at the roof. So we need to basically add 100 to that. So the fire pump in that building is probably gonna run at about 200 PSI to deliver 100 PSI static or residual on the roof. And uh, because of that, we need to put different types of valves in the building. So things that you're gonna see is that on uh, lower floors of the building where you have high pressures, you're going to have either pressure reducing valves or you're going to have standard weight hose valves with a pressure restricting device on it because we can't have more than 175 PSI coming out of those valves. Uh, it's just too dangerous for the hoses to be hooked up to. So uh, in a typical setup, you'll have uh, pressure, pressure restriction on the lower floors and the upper floors of the building. Uh, may not require any pressure restriction, so you'll have a standard weight hose valve flowing uh, 250 gallons per minute, somewhere in between 100 and 175 psi. So, like a common layout in buildings downtown, for example, uh, you'll have PRBs in floors 1 to 15. Um, that's the pressure re uh, reducing valve. Uh, PRDs, pressure restricting devices, on a standard weight hose valve, uh, let's say from 16 to 25. And then standard valves from 26 and up because uh, the pressure um, is suitable to not have any kind of restriction. And again, that's just to, to use as an example. These are some uh, different pictures of the types of valves that we'll talk about. Uh, this is a standard weight fire hose valve. There's no pressure restriction on this whatsoever. It's a two and a half inch threaded outlet. And that wheel, when you open the wheel, the wheel is directly attached to the valve stem itself. All of these valves, whether uh, they're standard weight or pressure reducing, they're all designed to flow 250 gallons per minute uh, between that 100 and 175 PSI. Um, and again, that's static and residual pressure. When you take the cap off of a standard weight hose valve, you look up in there and you can see the threads for the wheel itself right there. And that's when you know that you have a, a standard weight hose valve with no pressure restriction. Uh, a lot of times the firefighters have a hard time determining which valve is which. So they'll look at these valves and they'll say, well, how can I tell which one is pressure reducing and which one is not? So uh, it's very important to recognize that um, they do look differently from the outside, but if you can't really tell, you can spin the cap off and look right up inside the cap and you see the threads and you know that this is a standard weight hose valve. There's no pressure restriction on it. This is a standard weight hose valve with a pressure restricting device. Uh, device is the key word. It's basically uh, on the outside of the valve, um, somewhere along this, um, the, the hand wheel right here. And basically what it's designed to do is it reduces the downstream water pressure under flowing conditions only. Uh, we talked about NFPA 14 limiting pressures between 100 and 175 PSI, uh, static or residual. These devices only restrict pressure when uh, water is flowing, which is the residual pressure. Uh, they can be adjusted or they can be completely removed. My suggestion to firefighters is that you just completely remove it and uh, control the pressure on your own by either closing the valve or using a separate gate valve off of that discharge. So with this one right here, what you would do is basically uh, just pull that pin if you needed more pressure. What this is going to do is as this wheel is opened here, this entire setup is going to move with that wheel and the little metal pin right here is going to hit that flange and when it hits that flange you can't open the wheel anymore. Um, so if you need to get more pressure out of the valve you pull that pin and then you can fully open the hand wheel. It'd be nice to have these signs uh, in all these places but uh, the signs like this are not required by NFPA currently and um, it's up to the building owners to put them in, but a lot of times firefighters will say, well, how do, I, 
how do I get that thing out? And it, this sign right there just tells you, you, you just have to simply pull it. This is another type of pressure restricting device. It's on the outside of the valve again. Um, this one is set in place with three little set screws. Uh, again, this is a standard weight hose valve. So once we take that device off, you can fully open that wheel and, and get um, full flow of the valve, 250 gallons per minute between 100 and 175 PSI. Now, this is a couple different pictures from the same building with these devices in it. And if you look, you see any difference. We talked about pressure restriction inside of a building. So this pin right here on this pressure restricting device is kind of set far back. This pin is buried into the device. So with this one, I'm going to be able to open the wheel a lot further than I would be able to open this one. And the reason being is that uh, for pressure restriction, right? So uh, this one right here with the pin that's buried, this is on the a lower floor of the building. I want to say that this is on the first or second floor of the building. Uh, because there's high pressure here, they don't want you opening the wheel too much. This is on an upper floor of the building, and that's why the pins are set differently. Again, there's three set pins. You just adjust it with, a, uh, with an Allen wrench, uh, three different places, unscrew it, and you can take it right off. Here's another uh, couple more examples of pressure restricting devices. I mentioned that for the most part, they're visible on the outside, like all the other ones that we've seen, and this one here too which is when you just remove that nut or loosen up that nut and you can spin that right out of the way and nothing will catch that flange, you can open the wheel fully. The reason why it's key to open up that cap on the valve and look up inside is because some valves will have pressure restricting devices on the inside, like this one over here on the right. This is an orifice place, orifice plate. If you notice on the outside of the valve on the hand wheel, there is no device in place here to restrict pressure. Uh, so this one is strictly on the inside. Firefighters again would open up that cap, see that orifice plate, and immediately remove it um, with pliers or a halogen bar, pop it out of place so that you have access to full pressure from that valve. So now getting into uh, pressure reducing valves, there's a couple different types. You have your factory set pressure reducing valves, and you have your field adjustable pressure reducing valves. This is a picture of a factory set pressure reducing valve and also shows you a cutaway here. So uh, how this acts is that it basically uh, reduces pressure at a fixed percentage of the inlet pressure. Um, there's many different types. Uh, you'll see them uh, labeled with different letters uh, and that basically just tells you what type of pressure reduction ratio the valve is designed to give. Um, a good analogy of pressure reducing valves is that uh, basically, a factory set pressure reducing valve is only giving you, if you look at, uh, let's say, a pie, and you have eight pieces of pie, the factory set pressure reducing valve is only giving you one piece of that pie. Uh, it's set at a certain reduction ratio, and you can't get, um, you can't change it. So uh, you get that one piece of pie, and that's it. And the field adjustable pressure reducing valve, um, they're giving you that entire pie. You have the option to set it however you want so that you can have all the pie, or half of it, or only one piece. All right, here's a picture of a factory set pressure reducing valve inside of a building. And one thing I always try to stress to firefighters is that uh, there's a lot of um, uncertainties when it comes to these valves. For one, they need to be hydro hydrostatically, uh, or excuse me, hydraulically calculated correctly if they're all going to be set at different settings in a building. Sometimes you'll have uh, a building just have every single pressure reducing valve set the exact same way so that it takes away um, some common errors like misplacements of valves in wrong locations. And a lot of times people will think that it's not going to happen because it will all get caught during inspections. But this is a building where I didn't even catch this until I looked at the picture. But I took this picture inside of a building in the lobby. There's a pressure reducing valve in the lobby of the building, and uh, it's probably going to be hard to see there in the camera. But right here, it tells you on the tag where that valve is supposed to be located in the building. And on that tag, it says seventh floor. And again, this was in the lobby. So my concern is that I want to know where the one that says first floor is. Is the one for the first floor 
on the seventh floor because if that is, then we have a big problem. Um, it's important firefighters have to know about that uh, because if we're trying to get more pressure out of a valve, uh, especially one of these factory sets, we're just simply not going to get it, um, and especially if they're in wrong locations like that. Uh, it is a simple fix if it is realized uh, the building has already been completed and everything's in place. Oh, we noticed that this one on the seventh floor is in the lobby. Um, the company can come in and take this entire assembly out and simply swap it so that the valve itself stays in place. What you're doing is you're taking the type of the valve out, right? So that type is the setting, right? Like if you look down here, the valve setting for this one is a U. Uh, so maybe they just go and they find the one for the, the first floor. And again, I'm just making this an example. That one has a valve setting of T. So they take both of these valve assemblies out, leaving the valve in place on the pipe, they take the assembly out and they simply swap them. And that's how they could uh, fix that. Uh, the good thing about these factory set PRVs is that uh, nobody can mess with them. Um, somebody can't go and, and try to adjust the pressure uh, without uh, uh, like the field adjustable ones. These are field adjustable PRVs and um, a couple different ways to adjust these. For one, they have to be adjusted in the flowing condition only. So this valve has to be fully open and flowing in order to adjust it to where you want it. Um, again, hydraulically speaking, the valves will be flowed and set uh, according to their design and then delivered to the site and installed. If firefighters need to adjust these on site uh, with the proper tools, they could do so. We talked about One Meridian Plaza being a catalyst for change when it comes to sandpipes. And uh, if the tools were available and if the training was there, maybe the fire department might have been able to get more water and more flow out of that standby valve. A um, couple of different ways to adjust it we'll get into in a second here. Uh, this is uh, basically a technical data sheet of uh, just an, one example of a pressure reducing valve. Okay, so this is a Zern Wilkins pressure reducing valve. And you can see how you have different settings on this curve uh, with different flows. And again, this is all designed to flow uh, 250 gallons per minute between 100 and 175 psi. Uh, for the sprinkler valves, you have to have a minimum pressure right here of 50. Okay. All right. So how we're going to adjust these? Uh, th this is again from Zern. It tells you exactly how to adjust their pressure reducing valves, their fuel adjustable pressure reducing valves. If you look back here, you see these A dimension settings. Okay, and you have all of these. Uh, different settings here for the A dimension. The A dimension is this distance right here from uh, basically nut on the inside of that stem out to the wheel. So if I took a 1 and 1 16th deep well socket and adjusted, and adjusted that nut, I would be able to either increase or decrease the pressure coming out of the valve. Another type of setup is the uh, Giacomini's that have the, um, the rods that require the rods to adjust. Uh, you're gonna, again, NFPA says that these tools are supposed to be located in the fire control room. Um, they're simply not. I've been in a lot of buildings, checked out a lot of fire control rooms. I've seen a lot of pressure, field adjustable pressure reducing valves, and I have not seen one tool available to adjust them if the fire department needed them. Uh, so that's why I carry this with me um, in case I needed to adjust a uh, field adjustable valve. Uh, these rods, again, are supposed to be located in the fire control room. Uh, sometimes you'll, you'll see nice setup. Again, this is a perfect world. A nice setup where you have a pipe wrench and the rod to adjust. Um, and here's a sign on the valve over here. It tells you that the tools to adjust the pressure valves are located in the fire command room. Okay, so this is a, an example of that perfect world setup where there's a sign on the valve telling you that if you needed to get more pressure, that the tools are located in the fire command room. You go to the fire command room and the tools are actually there. All right, so how we would do this is that uh, using that pipe wrench, we would, uh, and, again, and again, this is with that valve fully open. So we have the valve wheel fully open. Water is uh, coming out of that valve into the fire department's hose lines, and we're able to unscrew that bonnet with the pipe wrench and using that uh, deep socket 
if we have the deep socket, we're able to get that in there on that, on that nut and turn either counterclockwise or clockwise, increasing or decreasing the amount of pressure as necessary. This is that Giacomini valve that I was talking about, the one that requires the specialized rods to get in there and adjust the water flow. And again, uh, just like the other with the Zern valve, this wheel would be fully open, water would be in the firefighters' hoses and flowing out of those hose lines while we adjust the pressure. Um, this picture right here is a zoomed in version right there on that valve. So basically, if you look here, you see that NFPA requires between 100 and 175 PSI static and residual flowing. And uh, an old saying in fire service is that we should always plan on the minimum. Anything, le anything more than the minimum should be considered a gift. And if we look at this valve right here, uh, that's exactly what the fire department would be met here with this Giacomini valve, is that it is preset at 800 PSI. You have the, the two arrows on the top and the bottom telling you that where the setting is, and if you follow that line, uh, wipe the dirt away, and you can see that it's set right on 100. And again, the perfect world setup for here is that those tools in the fire command room are available. We have those rods, and with the valve open and flowing, we're able to uh, stick the rods in there and adjust counterclockwise or clockwise, uh, increasing or decreasing the flow. Sometimes you'll see on these valves that they have uh, tamper switches on the outside. And basically what this does is um, it sends a supervisory alarm to the fire panel. All right, there's a couple different alarms on the fire panel that we need to be uh, familiar with. And one is when the fire, when the fire alarm system is in full alarm, uh, let's say from like a water flow switch or, uh, or a pole station, uh, the fire alarm is activated and you know, people will be evacuating the building. Uh, savvy arsonists sometimes will come over and if there's not a tamper switch located on the valve, they may be able to close, uh, let's say, a sprinkler floor control valve and shut down the sprinkler system for the building, and then they can get away with, uh, with starting a fire and trying to burn it down. So a lot of times you'll see tamper switches on the valves, the, the floor control assembly valves. And what that does is that if I try closing that valve even a quarter of a turn, it's going to trip a signal and send a signal back to the fire alarm panel. Uh, the fire alarm won't be activated and sounding through the building, but the fire alarm panel itself will be ringing, letting you know that there's a uh, supervisory alarm, that there's something wrong in the building with the system. And again, a lot of it has to do with the tamper, sw tamper switch. All right, uh, one, one important thing before we move on here is that uh, also with system maintenance, okay? So why are these floor control valves gonna be closed? Uh, maybe a savvy arsonist trying to close them or the building is being worked on, the system is being made, uh, maintenance performed on it and they have to close the valve in order to do so. Uh, if they complete their job and they leave the job site without opening up that valve, you're gonna have that supervisory alarm ringing from the panel and it's important to realize that, um, that there could be a, a closed valve somewhere in the system. All right, so here's, uh, again, this is that picture from that wet manual standpipe. But if you look at the acceptable piping arrangement out of NFPA 14, uh, this is that exact setup. So you have your combination sprinkler and standpipe riser with the drain and the associated trim. You have your uh, check valve, your pressure gauge, your water flow switch, and your inspector's test and drain. All right, so looking at this riser, basically breaking it down and letting you see all the components. This is the standpipe, uh, the combination standpipe, right, for the sprinklers and the um, for the sprinklers and the hose valves, and you have your drain riser right next to it. Pressure gauges are located on here in a couple different places. Uh, on the inlet side of the pressure reducing valve, you have the inlet pressure there. And you also have on the sprinkler side, you have uh, the inlet side and the discharge side of that pressure reducing valve. You'll have sprinkler ga um, pressure gauges there. Here's that tamper switch I was talking about. This is the floor control assembly. So uh, if that valve was partially closed, it would trip a signal. This wire right here, come back, that's all tied into the fire alarm panel and you'd have a supervisory alarm activated at the fire alarm panel. 
Uh, right above the, the valve, you have a water flow switch. So if this system is tripped, if you have a broken sprinkler head or an activated sprinkler head, if water is flowing, uh, water will move through that uh, pipe and the water flow switch will pick that up and send an alarm to the panel as well. And that's the difference again, like I said, between the supervisory and a full fire alarm. Uh, if a water flow switch is activated, that's gonna actually trip the fire alarm. You'll have the fire alarm ringing throughout the entire building. Also on this floor control assembly, you have the inspector test and drain. And here's the electric circuit that goes back tied into the fire alarm panel. Again, that's the sprinkler floor control valve. Here's the uh, fire hose valve for the fire department. This is a factory set pressure reducing valve. And again, why is that other connection there? That is not a secondary source of water for the fire department. That is the NFPA 25 um, fire hose valve test connection where every five years that valve has to be fully flow tested. All right, so getting into uh, NFPA 25 again, NFPA 13 does not deal with any kind of inspecting, testing, or maintenance. It's strictly for uh, the design and the installation of the system. And a separate standard, NFPA 25, is uh, in circulation for the inspection, testing, and maintenance of everything to do with the water-based fire protection systems. So that includes your uh, sprinklers themselves. It includes all the gauges, all the hose valves. Uh, it includes the supervisory signals. And that would be, you know, like the, the tamper switches and everything. Um, water flow and tamper switches. See that right up here. Gauges, sprinklers. And again, a lot of these are, uh, depending on what it is, it's uh, designed to be inspected or tested or maintained on a, um, an annual, a quarterly, semi-annual basis. Uh, depending on sprinkler heads, some sprinkler heads uh, need to be tested every five years, like right here, sprinklers in extra high or greater temperature uh, ranges need to be tested every five years. And uh, depending on where they are, again, the fast response sprinklers every, every 20 years, 50 or 75, and what they do when they test them is that they, they will take a, a sample in an area, they won't test every single sprinkler head, they'll take a sample from an area and test that sample. If the sample passes that test, then they all do. And that's how they maintain their their entire system. Uh, the, the valves again, they're hydrostatically tested every five years. Um, you have a, with the pressure reducing valves, you have a test where they simply just open the valve just to release that seat and take the pressure off the seat of the valve uh, with no water flow where they just need to drain the water into a hose bucket. And then you have every five years where they have to do a full flow test of, of the valve itself. Right, uh, NFPA 25 uh, breaks down again every single part of the system. Um, we talked uh, about the different the valve, uh, the stand pipes with the dry pipe valve. So they have dry pipe valve designations to be tested as well. Uh, they're really looking for the air leakage every three years. All right, and uh, annual maintenance on control valves. Uh, the pre-action and the and the dry pipe valve. Okay, so now we're going to go out and look at the valves on the outside here at our wet lab at Sprinkler Medic University. We talked in the class about uh, the types of standpipes that feed our sprinkler systems. Uh, the differences between wet and dry, automatic versus semi-automatic and manual. And then we also talked about uh, single interlock and double interlocking systems. So we're going to go outside and we're going to talk about all the types of systems and actually operate the valves as part of the hands-on portion of the class. All right, so come with me. Okay. All right, so now we're going to talk about the standpipes at our riser bank outside here at Spring Climatic University. Uh, our first two risers right here, these are our residential uh, standpipe risers. And all standpipes are important. They supply the water to our fire sprinkler systems. Uh, the first one here is the uh, residential riser following the 13D standard. Uh, the reason why this is smaller than the 13R, which is over here, is because the 13D system is uh, a lot of times tied into the domestic water supply. <coughs> so we're allowed to have uh, smaller piping systems. Uh, we have your uh, butterfly control valve here, 
your water flow indicating switch, your pressure gauge, and your inspector's test and drain. We also have a backflow preventer here, um, the double detector. We don't want the sprinkler water mixing with the domestic supply. Uh, the 13R riser, a little bit bigger than the 13D. Uh, for the 13D, we want to try and tie into domestic plumbing uh, to supply the water. 13R, we simply can't do that. Larger buildings, you can't uh, use domestic water for a uh, four-story, 200-unit building. So you have to have a larger riser. The equipment is still the same. We have the butterfly indicating uh, control valve. We have a water flow indicating switch, the pressure gauge, and the inspector's test and drain, as well as a backflow preventer to prevent the sprinkler water from mixing with domestic supply. Uh, this right here is a NFPA 14 stamp pipe, a larger riser, industrial, commercial, or high-rise buildings, and this shows you the different types of valves that you'll see off of this stamp pipe. So this right here is a standard weight fire hose valve for fire department use only. This is a factory set pressure reducing valve for fire department use only. This is a field adjustable pressure reducing valve. Again, we talked about this in the class, how this can be adjusted by with the wheel fully open, water flowing out of the valve through the fire department hose lines. Uh, we're able to take a pipe wrench and take this bonnet off. And with an inch and one sixteen steep socket, we're able to turn it counterclockwise or clockwise, uh, depending on what we want to do, increase or decrease our pressure. Uh, these are two and a half inch valves coming off the standpipe. It's a combined standpipe and sprinkler riser. You're going to have a control valve, a, a pressure reducing valve for your sprinkler systems. Um, this has the tamper switch on it so that if I were to close the floor control assembly, being a savvy arsonist, it would trip a supervisory alarm back at the fire alarm panel. And again, you have your water flow indicating, your pressure gauge, and your inspector's test and drain. Okay, so now we have a, uh, the most basic of wet stamp pipe risers. And sometimes this is referred to as a shotgun riser, or uh, it's called a straight gut riser, meaning that they, there's nothing in the belly of the riser itself. There's no valves. Uh, and the basics of the NFA standard, you have your floor control valve, your, your control valve, you have your water flow indicating switch, pressure gauge, which would be located right here, and your inspector's test and drain. Uh, we don't really see a whole lot of these except uh, if you have a, a really large warehouse type building, a newer construction, uh, you'll see a, a straight gut riser like this with, with no valves in the riser system. Where we see uh, older type styles, uh, this is an alarm check valve. Again, it's still a wet riser, wet standpipe riser. Uh, this is Right here, this is the alarm check valve, and what the alarm check valve does is it serves a couple different purposes. Uh, it checks in the pressure for the standpipe riser, and then it also serves as an uh, as an alarm. It only does a audible alarm and not electrical. And the electrical alarm, that's your flow switch. Uh, there's no flow switch here because the alarm check valve creates the alarm. And how that works is that. Uh, when the alarm is, when the valve is tripped and water is flowing through the system, uh, this is a retard chamber here. What this does is that it, it accepts normal surges in water pressure. So when do we have a normal surge in water pressure? Typically at night, when nobody's using water anymore and nobody's showering. Uh, wake up in the morning and everybody showers, water pressure drops. So the water can rise and fall in this retard chamber and not trip any kind of alarm. When we do get the alarm, is when we have water flow from the sprinkler head. So if the sprinkler head activates, water rises through the retard chamber, up through the piping, and goes through the And that's our audible water flow for the uh, alarm check valve. And again, basics is the control valve, pressure gauges, uh, retard chamber here with the alarm check valve, and the water motor valve. Uh, where you'll see these is a, a lot of cities, um, like Los Angeles, requires these in all their buildings uh, because when uh, earthquakes and fires, uh, you may not get the electronic water flow switch to work properly. 
So they require this retard chamber with the alarm check valve to, uh, with the water motor valve to activate the alarm. Okay, so now we're going to talk about uh, dry pipe systems, right? Everything from here over, this is a wet, those are wet systems. And we prefer to have wet until we can't. And where we can't is in climates where we can't um, uh, keep the temperature at 40 degrees or higher. Um, we want to put dry systems in. Uh, in Miami, though, we do have dry valves, dry pipe valves, uh, where you'll see them in uh, storage, uh, freezer storage coolers. Uh, so we have that dry pipe valve. And how this works is this is uh, the differential that we were talking about in the class. The 5.5 differential, meaning that the air pressure is not 5.5 times, times stronger than the water pressure, it's the surface area. So the surface area above the valve is 5.5 times larger than what's on the other side. Uh, so this is being held in check with air pressure, keeping the, the valve closed. And when we have a sprinkler head, either accidentally get hit with a ladder and breaks or activate due to a fire, water is coming. It's going to drain the air out of the system, dry pipe valve will open up, and water will come. Okay, so when we do have water flowing from the dry pipe valve, in order to reset it, uh, a couple steps that we have to uh, take. Anytime we want to reset the, a valve in the system, what we do is we need to close the control valve. That's going to stop water flow through the system. Once the water flow is stopped through the system, then we want to open the main drain. With the dry pipe valve, we only have uh, the main drain on the bottom side of the valve. So we're going to open up the main drain, drain the entire system and the valve. We're going to, using our tool, we're going to open up the faceplate here. Okay, and when we open up that faceplate, we're going to expose the valve seat. We're going to reset the seat of the valve with a specialized tool, put the faceplate back on, and then we're going to close the main close the main drain. We fixed our problem, right? So I either have our, our test and drain close here, or I replace the sprinkler head that caused water flow in the first place. Our problem is fixed. And then once the problem is fixed, then I can open the control valve and restore water to the other side of the valve. Okay, so now we're going to talk about another type of dry system, and that's the pre-action system. A pre-action system is installed because I'm concerned about accidental water flow. It's a dry system, but unlike the dry pipe valve, where if I lose air pressure, I'm opening up that valve and I'm getting water flow, the air pressure in a pre-action system is for supervisory purposes only. Meaning that if I knocked into a sprinkler head with a ladder and lost air pressure in the system, I would not get water flow because the water flow with the pre-action system strictly comes from the, the detection. So this is a single interlocking pre-action system, meaning that it's activated by one smoke detector. Okay, so when the smoke detector senses that there's fire conditions, it's going to trip the system opening up this solenoid right here, allowing water to flow into the piping for the system itself. Now when a sprinkler head reaches its ignition temperature and activates, I lose that air pressure. I have water in the pipes already, ready to discharge water on the fire. However, similar circumstance, that, that sprinkler head gets hit with a ladder. I'm going to lose air pressure, but I don't get water flow because the smoke detector has not said that there is a fire. So what I'm going to do is, is demonstrate that. Utilizing the inspector's test and drain, we're going to simulate that a sprinkler head got hit with a ladder and we lose our air pressure. I haven't flowed any water in the system, but I get a supervisory alarm at the panel. All right, so we're going to acknowledge that alarm, and we're going to fix our problem, and then we restore the system. Okay, in a fire condition, that smoke detector is going to activate, sensing smoke. It's going to trip that solenoid filling the pipes with water. Now when that sprinkler head opens, due to the fire, now we're flowing water. Okay, so in order to reset this system, a couple different steps need to take place. First we need to close the control valve. 
This is going to turn off water flow completely. So now that the control valve is closed, water is not flowing any longer. I need to open up the drains for the system above and below the valve seat. And when I do that, I need to reset the solenoid to restore the air. So I'm going to acknowledge the troubles and I'm going to reset that solenoid. Now I have my air pressure back because the solenoid was closed. I still have supervisory alarms because I have the control valve that's closed here. So we're going to not acknowledge them. We're going to close our drains again. So now the whole system is drained. Our air was restored. We're going to fix our problem, meaning the sprinkler head is replaced. And now I come back to the control valve and open up the control valve to restore water to the system. So now I have my air pressure and my water pressure restored. Now because the valve was messed with again, we're going to have supervisory alarms. We come back and we acknowledge the supervisory alarms and reset the panel. As long as you have a green panel, meaning no red or amber lights, you're good to go. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the double interlocking pre-action system. Again, these are electric pneumatic systems, meaning that they only flow water if there's two things present, loss of air pressure and the detection. The detection is the only thing that operates the pre-action system. Again, they're installed in areas where I'm very concerned about water. The double interlocking system requires a double zone detector to operate. So similar with the single interlocking pre-action system, I could knock into a sprinkler head with a ladder and lose air pressure and I'm only going to get a supervisory alarm. There is no water flowing through the system at this time. I can acknowledge the problem, fix the condition, and reset the panel and the system is completely restored still. Okay, now in a fire condition, we're going to get that smoke detector to activate. And I'm going to get a smoke alarm in zone one. But right now, the electric solenoid has not tripped yet. Okay, with the single interlocking, that one detector trips the solenoid, allowing water to flow into the piping. With the double interlocking, I need a double zone detector to operate. If you hear that little click, that's the solenoid opening. And now the solenoid's open, ready to receive water. So now that when that sprinkler head operates, I'm going to lose air pressure, the valve opens, and now we're flowing water. In order to restore this system, same steps need to be taken as the single interlock. I'm going to close the control valve. So I want to shut down all the water flow to the system. With the control valve closed, now I'm going to open the main drains above and below the valve seat. Now we're draining all the water out of the piping and off the valve seat itself. Okay, I acknowledge all the troubles and I'm going to reset so that the solenoid closes. Alright, now I can go ahead and close my drains again. Okay, we've fixed the problem with the sprinkler head. And now you can see the pressure gauge, the air pressure gauge is now restoring. Now I can come over and open up my control valve again to put water back into the system. And then you just want to clear out the supervisories. You're acknowledging the supervisories from the tamper switches with the valves and the water flow. And then we reset the panel. As long as you have a green panel, you're good to go.
basically it for uh, Sprinklers 101 from Circumatic University. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed it. If you like us, uh, good feedback, bad feedback, let us know so we can improve. And uh, look us up on Facebook and follow us. We are social and enjoy the interaction. And again, thank you very much.